Welcome to worship today. This service is a companion to our 2021 Synod Assembly with the theme sent out with good news. We celebrate the fact that with vaccines available, we are more and more able to go out of our homes and thus have opportunity to share with others the good news of Jesus Christ. We are reminded that the task of sharing God's good news belongs to all Christians, not just to pastors and deacons. Each one of us is commissioned to share the good news of Jesus Christ through word and deed, acting out of love for our neighbors so that this world might reflect more of God's mercy, justice, and love. In this service, we celebrate over 50 years of the ordination of women in our church. In 1970, Pastor Elizabeth Platts was ordained in November, and Pastor Barbara Andrews in December, the first two female pastors in the predecessor bodies of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. We celebrate and give thanks in this service for the gifts that female clergy bring to our church and highlight the women who serve as pastors and deacons in the Pacifica Synod. We also commemorate the decision at our, the 2019 Churchwide Assembly to ordain deacons with a service of affirmation of ordination for ministers of word and service. Deacon Taflin Fisher, who serves Christ Lutheran Church in San Diego, is here with me to stand in for all deacons in affirming their ordination vows. We invite deacons throughout our synod to join with Deacon Taflin in responses during the service. And I want to thank all who participate in this service. Particular thanks go to Pastor Laura Zeal, Pastor Jennifer Schultz for helping with the sermon, providing the sermon this morning. I also want to thank all our participants, both those who lead liturgy and those who provide music. Finally, thanks to Pastor Terry Tuvey Allen for her role in helping plan and coordinate the service, and to Rachel Line for her aid in editing the recordings. God bless you as you worship. May you be filled with God's hope, strength, courage, all you need to follow Jesus into the days ahead. And let us declare again the good news of Easter. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, source of all compassion and mercy and love. Hear this promise from 1 John. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so with that promise ringing in our ears and our hearts, we take a moment for reflection and confession. Most blessed God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God hears our cries. God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ and the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. be with you. Let us pray. O God, you give us Jesus as the vine apart from whom we cannot live. Nourish our life in Christ's resurrection, that we may bear the fruit of love and know the fullness of your joy. Through our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. 
Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord, and Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. A reading from the 16th chapter of Acts, beginning with the 11th verse. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We, resumed to this, we remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. Here ends the reading. Dear people of God, we begin with a word of introduction. Pastor Jennifer and I are preaching together today, two pastors for the price of one. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the ordination of women in the Lutheran Church and the 40th anniversary of the ordination of the first woman of color and the 10th anniversary of the ordination of LGBT people in our church. Jennifer and I represent half of that history. Pastor Jennifer is celebrating the 25th anniversary of her ordination this year. Congratulations. Thank you, Pastor Laura. So Pastor Laura and I have met and have known each other for over 25 years. We met first on June 1st of 1992 at Summer Greek at Luther Seminary. And we were even serving our internship together in the same synod, the Northwest Washington Synod. So we've known each other for quite a while. And we were able to reconnect once I moved back to the Pacifica Synod. And on the day of theological reflection in February of 2017, we were in a small group together and we turned our chairs to face one another and I was like, voila, we haven't seen each other for so long and now we reconnected. So Pastor Laura, why is this not the 25th anniversary of your ordination? That is a very good question, and here is the answer. I graduated from seminary pregnant with my oldest daughter, and though I interviewed and received a call, the pastor said, well, you're pregnant, and you know, it might be just too much work for you. So I did not receive a call in that first year after we graduated from seminary. Fun fact, 
The child that I was pregnant with is now a student at Wartburg Theological Seminary, and Emily is going on her internship next year. Yay, church. <laughs> <laughs> so next year will be your 25th anniversary of your ordination. Yes, it will. <laughs> Oh, dear people of God, we would like to speak to you today of those who carry the good news. We would speak to you of Lydia and of her courage and of her vision and hope. We would speak to you today of your courage, your vision and hope. You who have dared to hope on long journey. You who have dared to believe in resurrection at the end of a weary night. Grace and peace to you from the triune God who creates, redeems, and sustains. Amen. There are some stories in scripture that can almost get lost because of the corresponding stories around them. The story of Lydia, I think, is one of those stories. For it is surrounded by some rather dramatic stories where the Apostle Paul is a main character. But just before the story of Paul, before Paul and Silas being imprisoned, and that's a dramatic story in and of itself, if you know it, we are introduced to Lydia, and she is mentioned once again ever so briefly after Paul and Silas are released from prison. When I think of the story of Lydia, there are a few details that immediately capture my attention. And the first of these details is that she is named. She isn't referred to simply as a woman from Thyatira and her occupation, a dealer in purple cloth. And those are important details, but her name is shared. Her own name, not the name of her family or her spouse, but her name. There are many names shared throughout scripture, but there are many times when names are not included in the texts, probably for a variety of reasons, and many of those whose names are not included are women. While there's disagreement as to whether Lydia was her actually given name or the name associated with her because of where she was from, the mentioning of her name is still significant. So for me, whenever I hear a woman's name recognized in scripture, and while Lydia may be familiar, even recognized as a saint in some traditions, her name may not be familiar or as familiar as Eve or Sarah or Mary. Another one of the details that captures my attention about this story is her occupation. That, that was also named. That she was a dealer in purple cloth, and purple was the color of royalty. She was a respected and accomplished woman, seemingly independent and self-sufficient. Again, there is disagreement as to whether she was completely self-sufficient of her own accord or if she was perhaps a widow and gained her business through her husband. Even though we do not know for certain, what we do know is that she was there at the right time and her encounter with Paul and what he had to say about God changed her life. From what appears to be a chance encounter, in God's hands, lives are changed. God is active, not complacent. In Lydia's life, in Paul and Silas's lives, in our lives. God, through the death and the resurrection of Jesus, embodies hope, love, grace, and life. Lydia was so captivated by what Paul said, her already tender faith, blossomed and grew. The seeds had been planted. The words of Paul nourished and nurtured Lydia's young faith. And the spirit moved Lydia to action to open her home so that she could learn more. She was eager not only for herself, but on behalf of others as well. She was realizing what it was to be a believer in God through Christ. She was anxious to know more. She was connecting her faith to her life and the lives of others. God was actively moving in her life, and she responded by opening up her home to receive these apostles, not once, but twice. God is actively moving in our lives still today. 
Although it may not always feel like it, at times we may barely notice and maybe even feel that we are being ignored or forgotten or even forsaken by God. Yet God's action in our lives isn't one of consistency, consistent noticeable motion. It may come in moments of quiet and stillness. It may come in the reconnection of a friend from years past. It may come in knowing your name is known and imprinted on the heart of the one who created and redeemed you. It may come in recognizing the details of who you are. It may come in the form of an eagerness to learn more. It may come in the hospitality of opening your dwelling place. It may come in a chance meeting of someone new who has new and interesting stories to share. It may come in the ordinary and the everyday. It comes without our doing, yet it comes in the midst of all that we are doing. God remains active in our lives through our relationships, through scripture, through worship, through assembly, through prayers, through forgiveness, through love, through the cross and the empty grave, through the cleansing waters of baptism and the ordinary elements of bread and wine. God is active in both the expected and the unexpected. God is active in the lives of people whose names are shared and those whose names are known only to God, active in all of the details and all of the expanse. God is with us in Jesus, in the Holy Spirit, breathing life into us, stirring us to our own active faith. Lydia stood at the riverside. She was not one to stay at home, not one to hide behind locked doors. Hers was a riverside kind of life, and I wonder what God is up to now kind of life. She was a believer in God before she met Paul and Silas, and she was a seller of purple cloth. Lydia had navigated the Roman world of her day and found a place in a society that rarely gave women the opportunity to use the gifts that God had given them. But hers were gifts that she refused to hide. And I am very certain that fortitude and determination were two of them. She was a seeker, a spiritual woman, a woman seeking after the heart of God. She was at the river that day listening for the voice of God. And that's the hard work, isn't it? The listening. The doing can be exhausting and rewarding and tiring, but the listening, that is the heart work, the heart racing work, the life changing work. It is also the fear of what could be and what must be left behind. The joy of what might be in the new day. And to be honest, it is also the fear that there might not be enough of you for all that lies ahead. It has certainly felt that way this year. I don't know about you, but there has not been enough of me for this pandemic. It has overtaken me, wearied me, tested me. It has made darkness profound and light harder to see. But then there are moments, moments of surprising grace, moments of profound gift. For me, one of those moments was a few weeks ago. I had just received my second vaccination, and I was sitting on a hard metal chair for the 20 minutes that we must all wait before we leave the vaccination centers. For me, it was a listening moment, a riverside moment, a Lord, you've carried me thus far on the way moment. I was sitting outdoors under a white roof to easy up, 
and they decorated the easy ups with prayer flags of every color and they were ruffling in the breeze above my head. Nurses and doctors in scrubs, needles and clipboards, this intersection of loss and life, of death and resurrection. And as I looked up at the flags, I could feel the prayers embedded in it all. Prayers of sorrow for all that has been lost. Prayers of joy and prayers that now dare to hope. All of us gathered around me, people of every age, many languages, all strangers to me, yet a shared journey. The nurses who had seen too much and who carry with them the deep scars of loss. Those who had borne too much isolation and yearned to hold grandchildren in their arms. Weary workers who have been put too much at risk. And a pastor who sat alone thinking of her congregation and all that they have suffered. Thinking of all she has suffered. Thinking too of their joy and of hers and claiming hope under the prayer flags. Interesting, isn't it? A place of needles and alcohol wipes and people in scrubs become a place of prayer flags and hope and of our resurrection. A place that reminds us of all that has been lost but also a place in which new hope is born. Interesting, and so God-centered. Death and life in the same place, prayer and hope in the same place. From a tomb comes rising life for us all. The truth that Jesus is risen, the truth that this life is not easy, but it is always blessed. I used to love a line from Miriam in The Prince of Egypt that says, though hope is frail, it's hard to kill. After this year, I don't think that's true anymore. Hope may be the most resilient thing we have. It dares to rise again and again because Jesus dared to rise for the sake of the world. Because such a truth is centered in the human spirit, for those of us who confess Christ as Lord, for those of us who dare to believe in a cross and an empty tomb and dare to believe in the possibility of both. Hope is not only that to which we cling. It is the shape and form of our lives as we walk through this and every present darkness, as we walk through this and every future grace as we walk in the company of the risen Christ. Jesus shrugged off grave clothes as he walked free from the tomb, giving us the courage to shrug off our grave clothes as well. And here's the truth, dear people of God. The unbinding doesn't happen all at once, but one turn of the cloth at a time. Often, it's our eyes that are unbound first, so that we might see, as Lydia saw, the possibility of God and of grace. Sometimes it's a while before we're unbound enough to stand, before our legs hold us as we dare walk into hope. But dear friends, who better to carry the good news than those of us who know it comes from loss? Who better to dare to stand, to dare even to run, than those of us who understand that from such places comes the certainty of our hope? Paul and Silas left the riverside, the place of prayer that day, to be beaten and jailed and then to sing. Who better to sing of hope than us? They sat in the prison and sang hymns like all good Lutherans would. 
What else are you going to do in the darkness? And an earthquake shook the doors, and they walked into the light. Once released, did they run from their sorrow? They did not. The text says they returned to Lydia's home, to the one who had heard hope on the wind, to the one who had seen it at the riverside. Who better to carry the good news than us? Who better to run than a Samaritan woman who abandoned her water jar so that she might carry something much more important as she ran down the road to her village? She said he cannot be Messiah, can he? And she ran, fueled not by the ease of her journey, but by the acknowledgement of its pain. Better to run than Mary Magdalene at first light, running back and forth from the tomb four times that morning. The words, he is not here, he is risen, being embedded deeper and deeper in her with every step. It was not the tomb, but the journey that made the words true for her. And the journey has embedded the story in us embedded hope in us. There is so much to be learned on the journey and at the riverside. Does such a journey sound familiar to you? The exhaustion you have felt, the determination, the yearning need of hope. Who better to run than you and me who better to stand and dare to leave the grave clothes behind than those of us who know the power of life in the midst of death, of hope at the center of pain? Who better than us to know of the possibility of grace? And who better than us to share that hope with a weary world? Dear bearers of good news, thanks be to God for you. Amen.
we recognize Taflin Fisher and all the ministers of Word and Service in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Having been called to the ministry of Word and Service, having been consecrated or commissioned to this ministry, we affirm that they are included on the roster of those ordained as ministers of Word and Service, and we invite our deacons, our ministers of Word and Service, who are viewing this worship service to join in on the responses with Deacon Taflin when that time comes in the service. All baptized Christians are called to share in Christ's ministry of love and service in the world to the glory of God and for the sake of the human family and all of creation. You have been called as a minister of word and service to give leadership in the church's mission, to proclaim the gospel through word and deed. You have been entrusted with the ministry of word and service in the one holy Catholic church by the laying on of hands and by prayer. A reading from Luke. Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Deacon Taflin and all the deacons who are watching, before Almighty God, to whom you must give account, and in the presence of this assembly, I ask, will you continue to accept this ministry believing that you are called by God to serve faithfully as ministers of word and service? If so, please respond by saying, I will and I ask God to help me. I will and I ask God to help me. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America confesses that the Holy Scriptures are the word of God and are the norm of its faith and life. We accept, teach, and confess the Apostles, the Nicene, and the Athanasian creeds. We also acknowledge the Lutheran confessions as true witnesses and faithful expositions of the Holy Scriptures. Will you therefore continue to serve in accordance with the Holy Scriptures and these creeds and confessions? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you continue to be diligent in your study of the Holy Scriptures and faithful in your use of the means of grace? Will you pray for God's people, encourage and support them as they worship and grow in faith, and lead them by your own example in faithful service and holy living. I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you give faithful witness in the world through word and deed that God's love may be known in all that you do? I will, and I ask God to help me. Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, graciously give you the strength and compassion to perform them. Amen. Amen. And I invite those assembled here in the room and all of you at home to join in the following uh, acclamation. Will you, assembled as the people of God, to con continue to receive our deacons as ministers of word and service, sent by God to serve all people in Christ's name? If so, Saban by saying, we will and we ask God to help us. We will and we ask God to help us. Will you pray for them? Help and honor them for their work's sake, and in all things strive to live together in the peace and unity of Christ? We will, and we ask God to help us. Taflin and our deacons, continue to care for God's people, bear their burdens, and do not betray their confidence. Serve the needy, care for the sick, comfort the distressed, and through words and actions faithfully witness to God's love for all people. Cross every barrier that stands between the church and its ministry in the world. Seek out those places where the gospel of Jesus Christ meets the world's need. Empower, equip, and support all the baptized in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Lead us all in proclaiming the gospel in word and song, in witness and service. And be of good courage, for God has called you, and your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do God's will, working in you that which is pleasing in God's sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let it be acclaimed that Deacon Taflin and all our deacons are ministers of word and service of the Church of Christ together with all who are set apart and ordained to this ministry, deacons who are called to serve among God's people, as together we bear God's creative and redeeming love to all the world. Amen. Thanks be to God. When I pray, 
ever closer in your spirit, opening our hearts to your mission so that we may love as you have loved us. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God, our creator, you have created the heavens and the earth. As we wonder at the beauty of creation, inspire us to connect and care for the earth you have entrusted to us. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God, lover of our hearts and minds, you desire for all to rule with justice and love. Give the leaders of the earth assurance of your abiding presence, that they lead not by fear, but with love for those they are called to serve. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God, lover of the whole world, your love is steadfast. Help us to see our neighbors through your eyes. Empower us to be your hands of love, so that all in need of your healing touch the poor and rich, the lowly and haughty, the outcast and admired, the weak and strong, the fearful and fearless, will know your healing justice. Use us to meet the needs of all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our comforter, you hold us close when we grieve and despair. Hear these names of your good and faithful servants who have entered light eternal these past two years. We commend them to your spirit. The Reverend Charles Enter. The Reverend Harvey Anderson. The Reverend Carol Reed. The Reverend Robert Wayne. The Reverend Paul Oz. The Reverend Ronald Hovick. The Reverend Philip Berry. The Reverend Noel Estegren. The Reverend R. Joseph Romnerine. The Reverend Lowell Larson. The Reverend Dwayne Berg. The Reverend Jack Lindquist. The Reverend Albert Stott. The Reverend Laura Line. 
the Reverend Skip McComas, the Reverend George Johnson, the Reverend David Lindbergh, the Reverend Lawrence Roller. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray as Jesus taught us in the language of our hearts. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. The Almighty and living God, Creator, Redeemer, and Comforter, sustain you and keep you, fill you with courage, and keep you from all harm, this day and always. Amen. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Oh, <laughs>
It's only the 50th take. <laughs> Close enough.